Perfect. Okay. Um, can you, can you see, see my, my slides? slides? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, right. so let me just. This. Okay, so let me just remind you what uh, um, we were talking about the uh, sub Gaussian uh, random variables and the um, so sub Gaussian the variable one that uh, had this uh, nice uh, bound on its moment generating function. And we saw, for example, that um, Gaussians are examples of Gaussian random variables, bounded variables are examples. And then we have this nice tail bound, um, which uh, then extends to a sum of sub Gaussian variables through <coughs> this result that if you have uh, a sum of independent sub Gaussian uh, random variables, then um, that sum is still sub Gaussian with this parameter. And so, what we have now is um, um, let's see. Right. So what we have is um, this 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 bound, which is sometimes called the Hopstein bound, and um, this is just saying that. Uh, uh, let's look at, for example, this version. This is saying that um, the average, or right, one over nth sum xi uh, of a bunch of zero mean independence of Gaussian uh, variables is concentrated near zero, which is its mean. And you can see the n here. So the n uh, makes this a concentration result. So as it gets big, this tail bound goes to zero fast, uh, exponentially fast again. Uh, and so this is why these things are useful. So whenever you have the, so the Hofstein inequality is actually the case where the underlying sub Gaussian variables are bounded. So for the bounded case, if you replace the sigma with, with what we had before, uh, with this quantity, that would, be the, 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 this, this, this version of the sub, sub Gaussian parameter, that would give you the Hofstein bound. Um, but, um, Sometimes the general version in the HTTP book is called the Hofstein bound. So Hofstein bound is more or less in the generalized form a concentration inequality for the sum or the average of sub independent sub Gaussian random variables. Okay, and then we saw that there are equivalent characterizations of sub Gaussianity. Uh, so we had the tail bound characterization. Uh, we had the moment characterization, so the moments grow at a certain rate. We had this. Uh, MGF of X squared being bounded either in a neighborhood or actually at a single point. And we discussed that these are equivalent. Um, and, and then the other one, which is in the zero mean case, um, basically that this goes back to the definition we had before. So in the, in this, this version of the, or this, this um, equivalent representation of sub Gaussianity, we have, um, Give, gives us this notion of norm. So we can define a norm on the set of sub-Gaussian variables, which is the smallest t basically for which the, this MGF is finite. And then the two is for convenience. So this you can verify is a very valid norm. And all the other the constants in these characterizations are within a universal constant of that norm. Uh, and we discussed this. So for example, the sub-Gaussian parameter um, in particular, is within a constant factor of, of that sub Gaussian norm. So, all the bounds of the Hopping bound you can write in terms of the sub Gaussian norm. And for example, um, the fact that the sub bounded sub Gaussian variable is, sorry, bounded variable is sub Gaussian is equivalent to saying that the norm, psi 2 norm, the sub Gaussian norm is bounded by the L infinity norm. So, L infinity norm is a bound on the um, is a basically essential supremum of the uh, random variable as a function. So if x l infinity is bounded, um, l infinity norm is bounded, the random variable is bounded, which then puts a bound on the sub Gaussian norm. So this statement is basically saying, if you understand, saying that bounded variables are sub Gaussian. Exactly this statement here. Okay, questions? 
so far, so good. Okay, and then we had that um, if you do centering, um, the centered version of the subgaussian norm is bounded by subgaussian norm of the original one. And I mentioned that sometimes this, or often, uh, there are better bounds than this subgaussian norm of this deviation. So this is a valid bound, but not necessarily the best bound. And then last time, I guess we finished here. So if you rewrite the uh, proposition that we had, uh, that uh, let's say the subgaussian norm, the subgaussian parameter of the summation uh, squared is equal to the subgaussian parameters of individual ones. Um, so if you write it in terms of the, um, so these are subgaussian parameters. So sigma squared or sigma i, sigma is i is the subgaussian parameter of parameter of x i. Right, so that's the that's the basic idea. Um. And so if you do um, recall that the subgaussian parameter is within a constant factor, so subgaussian parameter is within a constant factor um, of the subgaussian norm, which is like up to constants bigger than or equal to or less than or equal to that. Uh, then this would translate to this result that the subgaussian norm of summation squared is less than or equal to a constant times the summation of the subgaussian norm. Okay, does that make sense? Core independent zero mean right? No questions so far. Okay, we talked about this, and then you can rewrite the Hopkin bound as um, so it used to be, if you remember, theorem two. Um, let me just write it here. So theorem two was probability uh, uh, i from one to n x i. That's the two-sided version. It's less than equal to two x negative t squared over two. Um, if you replace sigma squared with this, that would be theorem two. And so because um, so this should there should be two there. Um, so this should be two. So because of this result, basically, um, or you could directly use this result to, um, so you can either get it from this result um, by replacing sigma i's with constants times the psi two, or use this result. So from this result, we know that um, if you go back to this, this, um, this one, so let's say this, right? So we know that, um, this is equivalent characterization of uh, subgaussianity. Um, so let's say this is star. So if I use a star, for example, here, so you use a star. I know that, uh, so if I call this S, I know that the subgaussian norm of S is bounded by up to constant, I'm gonna write this uh, summation i from one to, this notation means uh, up to constant, so this notation less than or equal to up to constant. So I would get um, xi psi two squared. Um, and I know that the probability that x to s is bigger than t is up to, um, is, is, is like this, a constant t squared over um, psi two of s, right, from, from this result, from this result. Right, so I'm gonna use that result um, with S, so replace X with S. Um, so I have this, so use this, we get that. And then this is also bounded by, it's called a C1. Uh, 
So what happens if I replace um, S? So if I replace this with something bigger, does the bound become bigger or smaller? Anyone? Mm. Upper bounded by things because you have negative also. Yes, yeah, so this is going to be an upper bound. So I replace it with the upper bound on it. So I get, um, let's call this um, for example, this is going to be C1, let's say. There's this. So it gets C1 times the summation I am going to run out of space. So you can see one and summation i from one to n by x i psi two squared. Okay, and then these two would be a different constant, so I can call this some c two. And so you get this type of result. This with this being c two here. Okay, so so you can you can use that version. So this version with the psi two norm. Uh, is useful if you don't care about constants. Uh, and this version with the sigma is good if you care about constants. So you get at least a two here. Um, so, um, say, this version is good if you care about constants. Right. Questions? No question. Okay, so that's sub gaussianity for now. So let's now expand the definition. So not all not all random variables are sub Gaussian. Anyone knows of an example of a random variable that is not sub Gaussian? Not all arrays are sub Gaussian. Exponential. Sorry. Exponential. Examples of right. So examples of non-subgaussian variable. So exponential random variable. So um, so let's say x is exponential lambda. Um, so why it's not sub Gaussian? Because it is a heavier tail than uh, Gaussian. Right, mm -hmm. one way to- um, There's the intuition, my intuition. Yes, the intuition is the, um, so let's say the probability that X is bigger than T is integral zero to e to the negative lambda um, dx, which is uh, which is what um, e to the negative lambda t, so for t bigger than zero. Um, is that right? 
if t is bigger than zero, uh, that's the density of exponential. Yeah. Right, integrated from. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, this, this is minus. Uh, right. So this we have to do from t to infinity. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Then it's correct. Yes. So this is the tail on. So you can see the tail drops like into the negative lambda t. That t is square. Um, and you can argue that. Uh, this cannot be less than or equal to a constant into the negative some other constant t squared. So for it to have like a sub-Gaussian nature, I should be able to come up with a constant such that uh, this bound this bound holds. Oh, sorry, at least one sided of it. I, mean, um, I need the one sided version of this or two sided version of this, for example, hold, right? And um, so I can I can do this. So this is also because of um, exponential and very positive. I can put absolute values here, right? So it doesn't change anything. So this is equal to this. I can't say that this is less than or equal to let's say. Um, sorry. So there is no. I would say, uh, sorry. Um, there is no, there is no constant k such that uh, e to the negative lambda t is less than or equal to, let's say, twice e to the negative t squared over k. Right, because eventually, as t goes to infinity, this other side goes to zero much faster than this. So this can't happen. So this can't be a sub-exponential variable. Sorry, sub 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 Gaussian variable. Okay. So exponential random variable is not an example of this. And you can also use other characterizations. Uh, so for example, you can use the moment characterization to see if um, you can compute the moments of of the exponential and see if they um, they satisfy this. So are they going to infinity slow enough? Um, and you should you should get the same result. It shouldn't it it shows that it's not possible to find a constant like that. So do as an example. Is this clear to everyone? Yes, the other uh, people Zach mentioned exponential and Cauchy. Cauchy is another way. What so why Cauchy is not an example? Um, say one, two, Cauchy. So why? What is the PDF of that? I don't know what the Cauchy distribution is. So someone wants to illuminate us about the Cauchy distribution. So Zach is saying even t curtails than the exponent. So yes. So he doesn't want to. Yeah. Can you see the chat? Can everyone see the chat? Yes, yes, yes. I can see it's a one one by one plus x squared. I see. Right. The tails go to zero, um, like one over that would go to infinity as expected. Yeah, this is inverse polynomial. So which is yes. even uh, slower than exponential. Yes, exponential, yes. Um, another way of saying it is that the moments are just the first moment, even the first moment is not finite. So sub-Gaussian variables have finite moments of all order, which is related to the Oh, yes. oh yes, 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 yes. Right. OK, good. Um, so it depends on um, how heavy the tail is. And, um, so now we have a sub-exponential concentration, which is um, extending the um, sub-Gaussianity to include some of these variables. So in particular, um, a sub-exponential random variable in the far end of the tail behaves like an exponential variable. Um, so a zero mean random variable x is called sub-Gaussian, sub-exponential sub if, um, if we have that, that kind of the same uh, behavior for the MGF. Um, here I'm using nu instead of sigma, but it's the same formula. So the MGF is upper bounded by e to the 
nu squared lambda squared over two, nu is a constant. Um, but for the subgaussian, it was for all lambda, this is in the neighborhood of zero. I just required that this holds in the neighborhood of zero. And so subgaussian sub random variables obviously satisfy this because they satisfy the inequality over all lambda. Um, so, um, let's say sub-Gaussian class is a subset of sub-exponential class, um, but not vice versa. So the equality, the, like there are, there is like strict, this is a strict inclusion. So there are random variables that are uh, sub-exponential, but not sub-Gaussian. And uh, we'll see, for example, exponential random variable is an example of that. Um, is the definition clear? Okay, this seems like clear. Uh, so an example, another example, an example of these random variables is if I have, um, so say just in a neighborhood there neighborhood of zero. So if z is a normal random variable, then z is squared is sub-exponential. Um, and you can see that, uh, so what is the distribution of z squared? Do you, do you know the name of it? Anyone? If I have a random variable, which is Gaussian, if I square it, standard Gaussian. Yes, okay. David mentioned chi squared one, one degrees of freedom. So a chi squared with one degrees of freedom is sub-exponential. Uh, and the way to see it is to write down the NGF. Uh, so this is this, uh, so this, this business was for the zero mean. And the variable. So if things are non-zero mean, then we subtract the mean. So we say a non-zero like a general random variable is so exponential if this deviation from the mean is um, satisfies that. So because z squared is not the, the mean is one, so I subtract the one. So I, this is the NGF of um, so this is the NGF of z squared minus expectation of z squared. Okay, and then you do the calculation, it turns out to be this. Uh, so if lambda is less than one half, we get something finite. And if lambda is bigger than one half, it's infinite. So it's only finite in the neighborhood of zero. Um, so it, it's finite for, for all the negative lambdas. But for positive lambdas, um, it's just um, finite if lambda is less than one half. So now I have this uh, MGF bounded by e to the negative or e to the four times lambda squared over two. This is this you can verify that if you take lambda to be less than one fourth, uh, like not close to the boundary here, less than one fourth, then you can verify that this quantity is less than this. Um, and so this in particular, so this is verify this as an exercise. Um, verify. And so this shows that this random way was so exponential with parameters two and four. Okay, two is uh, because this is like two to the two and alpha is four. So I get nu and alpha. So if my notation is, um, so I'm gonna say this random way that satisfies this is so exponential parameters nu and alpha, okay. And the tails, tails are sort of heavier. So if you do the um, PDF or look at the PDF, um, you can see the tails are heavier than the Gaussian. Questions? I think you probably do it in homework exercises, but you can do the same. So do the MGF, for example, uh, um, the exponential random variable, uh, this guy and show that it's a finite in the neighborhood of zero. Okay, same idea holds. Questions, comments? 
No questions. Okay, so similar to similarly to uh, sub Gaussian variables, uh, we have a tail bound for sub exponential variables, uh, which looks like this. So the probability that x is bigger than t, this is the tail, uh, is bounded by this exponential, but it's negative of the minimal two terms. So one which be behaves like a sub Gaussian tail, the other one which be behaves like a um, so one which behaves like a Gaussian tail, the other one like the exponential tail. So this is the tail of an exponential. And so depending on how large t is, one of them is the smaller, and so one of them kicks in. So which one do you think kicks in when t gets large? Which of the two would be? T squared over nu squared or T over alpha, which one would be the dominant? T or alpha, why? Yes, because T squared grows faster than T, eventually T squared over nu squared is gonna be bigger than T over alpha, so eventually the minimum would be t over alpha, so the the large deviations behave like go like the tails at the like um, very large deviations go down like e to the negative t, which is like the tails of an exponential. But in moderate deviations, the first might might be dominant, and so it might behave like a Gaussian in the moderate sort of uh, moderate deviations. Okay, so how do we prove this? Uh, basically the same idea as, as the Chernoff bound that we did for the sub Gaussian case. So this is our Chernoff bound, if you remember. So this is bounded by this, and this holds for any lambda, so I take the infimum over lambda bigger than or equal to zero. And now I have um, the, uh, and then I replace this um, quantity with, um, by assumption, I know that this is this is less than or equal to e to the mu squared lambda squared over two for lambda in less than or equal to one over l. So I bound this. Um, yeah, I'm assuming the strict equal inequality here. So, but because this bound only holds for lambda equal less, it's so a less than or, equal, or less than one over alpha. I'm just gonna uh, put this. Uh, restriction uh, on the optimization. Okay, I, I can't optimize outside this because this bound only holds for those lambdas. Okay, does that make sense? So this comes from, let's say do this. So this is related to the fact that this holds here. Um, so lambda should be Non negative for the Chernoff bound and also has to be less than one over alpha because of that restriction. Okay. Now, the infimum, when I want to take the infimum, I can take the infimum of this inside because exponential is monotone. So I'll let the function be, let this be f, f of lambda. So, how do you minimize this? How should we minimize this? I solve this minimization problem. Anyone? Um, differentiate. Differentiate. Okay, so we can differentiate. So I can. Let's do it here. So differentiate. So I get f prime of lambda equal to zero which gives me negative t plus two lambda nu squared is zero, which gives me the t, let's I say mean, t star, has I to mean, be. You won't get two here because two and two will cancel out. Right. Two in the denominator. That happened, right. Uh, nu squared lambda equal to zero, and I get. Uh, I mean, you want lambda star, not t star. Yes, yes, yes. 
So lambda star would be t over nu squared, okay? Yeah. And this will give you some bound on uh, alpha or nu or whatever. So, okay. This, yeah, you want this to lie in zero to one over alpha. So this will give you some bound on, yeah. Okay, good. So you want this to be, right. So the thing is, um, so I have a function which is quadratic and I'm minimizing it over uh, zero to one over alpha. So if the function behaves like this, so, if, uh, so this is the stationary point. So this point is where the derivative is zero. So that would be t over nu squared. So if t over nu squared is less than one over alpha, okay, so if t over nu squared is less than one over alpha, then uh, minimizer is, is uh, just t over nu squared, okay? okay? So how about the case where t nu squared is bigger than one over alpha? What would that case look like? I mean, uh, uh, so minimizer would be one over alpha because the function is decreasing from zero to one over alpha. Uh, I guess. Is that so? I. Uh, So this is. Uh, so we can see the values at zero and at uh, one over alpha, and see which which one is bigger. Uh, okay, because, which one? Uh, so at t equal uh, at uh, uh, so lambda star is this. No, if you so the plot is not actually correct. So what is the what is the value of this function at zero? Yeah, at zero it is zero. Yes, so the function is this. The value at zero is going to be zero always. Okay. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. So this function would be something like um, this generally. So what I did was not. Right, so this goes here. That's the case where you're in this middle region. Uh, the other case would be, uh, we're still gonna go, so t over t over nu squared would be uh, somewhere outside this, right? So it would be t over nu squared would be bigger than. Yes, yes. So what you end up doing is you go from here um, to here and then you come back up. Yes. Okay. Yes. So then you can see that the minimum occurs is at one over alpha. Yes. So the minimum occurs is at the boundary. So in yes. this case, minimizer is, is one over alpha, right? Yes. So what I end up getting is that this is equal to, um, let's see. This is equal to what? This is gonna be, um, so if I evaluate at t over nu squared, I get uh, minus uh, t yes. squared over nu squared plus uh, t squared over two nu squared, okay? Yes. If I evaluate, so that's when uh, t nu squared is less than or one over alpha. So I'm uh, replacing lambda with this. So if you replace mm -hmm. lambda with this here, well, I would get that, right? T squared or nu squared, negative, and then T squared or two nu squared. That's one. Uh, and the other one is, what happens with the other one? Um, you can put one over alpha. It will be minus t over alpha. 
squared by two out of four squared. So yeah, the other case I'd get uh, negative t over alpha, right? Yeah. Plus yeah. root squared over alpha squared times two. Two alpha, yeah. Right. Alpha squared. Alpha squared, yes. So this part, uh, is fine. So this gives me what? Negative t squared over 2 mu squared, which is one of the things that I wanted. So that's this there. Mm. How about the other one? So the other one is when it kicks in where t mu squared is bigger than one of the alpha. So how should we deal with this? Uh, we further bound this So by this is t by, so t by mu squared is bigger than one over alpha implies that uh, mu square by uh, alpha is less than t. So this implies that mu square divided by what? Alpha, alpha. Is, is less than t. Less than or equal to t. Yes. Okay. And uh, then you can plug in here. So you. So you mu squared over alpha <coughs> squared would be less than t over alpha. Yes. Right? Yes. So you will get uh, minus t over alpha plus t over two alpha is minus t over two alpha. Yes, yeah, so this is gonna be less than t over alpha plus t over two alpha, right from here. I replace this with this guy. Yeah. Um, and this gives me the other, the other bound, right? Yes. It's a little bit messy, but we get the idea, right? So that's basically this. So one gives me this, the other one gives me this, but this is also bounded further um, by, by this assumption or by this, by this idea. Okay, so you can verify that for yourself, but that's, that's how you do this. Does that make sense? Questions? So this proves the bound. So why is the minimum? So it's like either one of them, and then you can verify that uh, it's just going to be basically uh, the maximum of the two or negative minimum. So uh, when the t, I mean, when t is less than this, this is going to be the bigger one, and when t is bigger, this is going to be the bigger bound, and or sorry, this this one, this one is going to be the bigger bound. So we can write this in compact form as this. So this can be written in compact form as this. Um, I believe this is actually equality. So this we can write this as equality. It's just another way of writing it. And then I can pull minus one half out and switch this to minimum. It changes the sign. So maximum of a negative would be negative of a maximum, a minimum. Does that make sense? Yes. Why? It should be inequ so Daniel says it should still be inequality at the end because all oh, right, okay, you're right. Yes, so um, I'm mistaken. So this this is wrong. So this should be less than or equal to. Or sorry, okay, no. This is equality, but then there is this inequality. So yes, so this is inequality. Mm. Thank you. Right. Okay, good. Questions? So this is not difficult. This is just an optimization problem. The difference with the sub-Gaussian case is that it's a constraint optimization problem. There was also a constraint optimization, but the constraint was very simple. It was like just a non-negativity. But here, the constraint actually matters. So here, the constraint makes the problem more interesting. So I have this bound. And this bound is, um, and it holds for any t. You can go and verify that for any t positive, non-negative, basically. So these are sometimes called finite sample bounds. So there is no restriction on t except that it be non-negative. And then the same bound holds with, um, as usual, if I replace x with negative x. 
same as um, the sub Gaussian case, and then the two sided bound holes if I put a two uh, there. So, so we also have this. If I put here, I can put the two here. So I have that bound with uh, the two sided case. Okay, now, no question? So we have the equivalent of the result that we had for independent sub Gaussian. So I have, let's say, assume that x i's are independent, zero means sub exponential. So the key is independent. And then zero means sub exponential random variables. Uh, parameters nu i and alpha i. Um, then uh, the summation of them is going to be sub exponential with parameters nu and alpha, where nu is just similar. Has, has similar behavior as the sub Gaussian parameter, uh, but the alpha is like the maximum of alpha i. Okay, so these are going to be the parameters of the new sub Gaussian, sub exponential variable. And so, because this is a sub, sub exponential variable, I get the same bound. I, guess the, I get this bound, uh, but with this new squared and alpha squared for, for the summation. So, I get that the summation, the tail bound for the summation is this. Where, where nu and um, uh, sigma are just um, like this. So that's the nu here, right? And that's the alpha here. Okay. Questions? So the tail bound just follows from the previous argument. The only thing that we need here is to verify that this is actually sub, uh, sub exponential with these parameters. Um, how do we verify that? Can anyone give me like an idea of the proof? Proof. I mean, Is it clear what we want to prove? We can do the same thing as that layer. I mean, just uh, e to the lambda summation of x i is bigger than e to the lambda t. E to expectation e to the lambda summation of x i. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, yes. Not, not yet. So this is equal to expectation of the product, right, yes. e to the lambda xi, yes. and which then is equal to product of expectation. Right. Product by what? By independence. Yes. And then we can bound it using the super exponential assumption of the xi's. Right. This is bounded by product i from 1 to n, e to the new i squared lambda squared over 2, right? Because each one is sub exponential, but I have to add a qualification. So, yes. does this hold for any lambda or? This holds for lambda, which is so earlier, uh, you can say lambda i. I mean, for for the so lambda i for the ith random variable has to be like the absolute value that has to be less than equal to one over alpha i. So here so, you can say for the full like the global lambda should be one over lambda one over max of the alpha i. Right. There is just one lambda. So for this inequality to hold, I need this to hold for all i. Okay, so okay. For each okay. one, I have this. Yeah, so you can say that i max over alpha. Yes, so I need lambda to be less than 1 over alpha for all i, yeah. so that I can use this inequality for all i. Um, right. And this is equivalent to uh, this is less than or equal to, let's say, minimum of 1 over alpha over i, or 1 over maximum yes. Yes. of alpha i over i. Okay. And so this is going to be my new um, alpha. And this side just simplifies to 
uh, e to the summation u i squared lambda squared over two. And this guy is just gonna be my mu e. Okay. So this is a separate bar so for lambda that has this. Yes, yeah, so Ian also pointed it has to be a smallest bound, which corresponds to the largest alpha. Yes. So you, you want to pick the smallest one of these. So the interval that we need is this determined by the smallest interval, which corresponds to the largest alpha. That's another way of saying. Yes, thank you. So basically that's the same argument here. And sorry, just just you can go through this with the same argument. So we have this result, which is interesting. Okay. Um, so the class of exponential random variables is pretty big, and this result gives you a nice tail bound, um, which which behaves um, it has these two regimes, uh, and this is very useful. So this is sometimes called Bernstein by by HTP. So the actual the classical Bernstein equality is a little bit stronger than this, uh, and you see it in homework one, um, but if you relax it a little bit. It would look like this. And the classical Bernstein is for bounded variables again. Uh, but um, this is somewhat general. Um, yeah, you'll see it in the homework problems. Questions? No questions. Okay, so so similar to the subgaussian case, we have equivalent characterizations of sub-exponential random variables. And so, for random variable x. Uh, the following are equivalent. So um, we either have a tail bound of this form, um, that's one characterization. And so you can see this ignores the sub Gaussian part of the bound. So as long as you can show this. Um, so for example, this bound like this implies something like that. Um, if, um, So is it gonna always imply something like that? So if I have something like this, does it mean that I can drop on the t squared one? So just verify for yourself that you can do that. So uh, by properly rescaling this k, because the nature of the bound at the infinity matters. So uh, once I have the bound at the like for sufficiently large, then I can uh, like, uh, re, um, redefine k1 such that on a finite interval the bound still holds. Um, just verify that the bound that we obtain um, implies this. Um, but but this is equivalent to if you can show some random variables like that then this random variable is so exponential. The moments uh, grow like uh, p the peak moment grows like p. So contrast with, contrast with root p for sub-Gaussian case. Um, the other one is that the MGF of the absolute value of x is uh, finite um, in a neighborhood of zero, but the neighborhood has to be um, positive. Um, let's compare this characterization with this with gas one. Um, sorry, it's moving fast. So you see here, there's no absolute value for like we don't have the absolute value characterization. Um, uh, 
but this is this is a little bit different. So that was for x squared. So this is saying the absolute value um, instead of the x squared. So it's co contrasted. Um, so this was x squared for the sub Gaussian. Sub Gaussian. And then we also have this one sided version here. So this is one sided. Uh, whereas for the sub, sub Gaussian case, we require this to be both sided. Uh, there, is a, there is a subtle difference. Um, the HTTP book goes in, over, which uh, I'm not going to talk about. So the more, the more interesting one is this version four, which is um, basically a minor, minor. Sorry, it's like a special case of three. So x squared for sub-Gaussian case. So for the sub-Gaussian case, we needed uh, so exponential of uh, x squared over k4. We bound it by two uh, for sub-Gaussian sub case. Um, here, we just do it for uh, the absolute value. OK, and the absolute value is this is this is much easier to satisfy rather than x squared. Uh, so it's a milder condition, as you can see. So this is saying that the MGF of the absolute value of x is bounded at a certain, at, at some point. Uh, and for the when the mean is zero, uh, then the above the above are all equivalent to. Uh, the characterization that we mentioned. So um, this is the original definition. So here, um, so using the, he's using the same, um, the same constants here, not two constants, same constant. So this is the HDP's character, like way of defining sub-Gaussian, sub-exponential variables. Instead of two parameters, he uses one. Um, he can always use one. Um, Let's say going back to this definition. So that's the definition. So can anyone tell me that why I can use a single constant here? Why this would be equivalent to, um, let's say, equivalent to saying that expectation of e to the lambda x is less than or equal to e to the, let's say k four squared lambda squared over two for all lambda less than or equal to one over k four. Why can I do that? Um, let me put this down here. So equivalent to the star is this for some k four. Why is that? You can choose k four to be max over like max of mu square and uh, uh, what is that? Uh, New, yes. So basically, the idea is that I can always, um, so I can increase alpha. If I increase alpha, the bound is still holds. Yes. Uh, if I increase new, the yeah. the bound is still holds. Yes. So I can keep one and increase the other such that I get. So whichever is the um, largest, I keep that one fixed. I increase the other yes. to match yeah. the, that one. Yeah. So I can yeah. always use uh, one constant, but. The, the one, the definition with two constants um, gives you more flexibility. Um, because again, in some cases, these constants might have different orders. So if you increase one, the bound is correct, but it's loose. So I'll just add this here that, um, however, however, the two parameter version gives more flexibility. And 
tighter bounds in general. By increasing one, um, you could lose tightness. Okay. So this is how the HDS high dimensional statistics book uh, defines sub Gaussianity, so sub exponential behavior. This is how um, HDP, the high dimensional probability book, uh, defines it. For single random variables, for which these, these constants are numerical values, it doesn't matter that much. But let's say for something like this, you can see um, here's an example where. Uh, you can see these two things are not of the same order. You see, one is the maximum, the other is the L2 norm. So you don't want to use the same. So you can't, you can't, you can use the maximum of the two, but the maximum of the two would behave very differently. Right, so um, if new i's are numbers, uh, and alpha i's are numbers, so this is an example where the two parameter the two parameter uh, definition gives a tighter tighter control so if um, If, for example, new i, I'm writing it like this. So it's constant up to like this is this means they're constant as a function of n usually. So alpha i's are also constant. Um, then uh, new i behaves like what? If they're n, let's say uh, if they're n variables. and n variables. Uh, here, so i is from one to n, let's say. I see. Then what is the order of nu? And nu is uh, square root of n, but alpha is still one. Yes, alpha will be of the order one. So you can see if you pick the bigger one, the alpha also goes like root n, which is not good. I see. Yes, yeah, so if you want to keep uh, this type of definition, uh, so this word, like this, this type, the two parameter one, um, um, will be in this case if you say that the summation is uh, sub exponential with these two parameters, it's equivalent to the tail bound. But if you say that it's sub exponential with a single parameter, then the tail bound that you get is not. Uh, good, but you have to be careful. So sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Questions? Any questions about this? Okay, so these are characterizations. This I think is repeat. Or sorry, this is just comparison with the sub sub exponential case. So again, you see, for example, this is root p here. This is p here. Um, this is x here, this is x squared here, and so on. Um, right. So similar to the case of sub Gaussian variables, we can define a sub-exponential norm. And the sub-exponential norm is um, the smallest state such that this is less than or equal to two. Uh, can you, uh, Daniel says something, can you maybe, Say it instead of me reading the chat. Do you yeah, wanna, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it says that the characterizations are equivalent um, to this number five when there's a when the mean is zero. So, yes. does that mean that we have to apply um, like to check that if x is sub Gaussian? Does that mean we have to apply these to like uh, x minus its mean? So. You have to apply five uh, to x minus its mean. 
Uh, but for the other ones, um, you can just apply it to X itself. Right? Okay. Yeah, so if you want to verify using either of these one up to four, um, then you don't need to subtract the mean. Right? But if you want to verify using this, if the mean is non-zero, uh, this in general is not going to hold. Um, so you subtract the mean and then verify it through that. So okay. only only the fifth one requires the mean to be zero. Yes. Okay. Yes, for it to be equivalent to subgaussian. Yes. Got other questions? Okay, so you define this norm. It's like one norm, so it's one shadow. This is a well-defined norm. Um, again, difference with the Gaussian case is that this is absolute value x instead of x squared. The proper norm, and then you can replace this, uh, these, these constants here. So um, the k1 would be up to a constant, the psi1 norm. This k2 would be up to a constant, the psi1 norm. Uh, all these constants are also going to be uh, up to constants, uh, numerical constants, psi1 norm. So you have these, all these things here. Um, and, and then there's, there are these constants like the UK, um, except for this one, which is by definition, um, it's a definition of the psi1 norm. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so now something more interesting um, is that if you have a random variable, which is sub Gaussian, then x squared is sub exponential and vice versa. So this is if and only if. And in fact, this, this can be written nicely as this identity. So if you take the square root, the square of x, x squared, the psi one norm of it would be the psi two norm of x squared. So if the psi two norm of x is finite, uh, then the psi one norm of x squared is finite and vice versa. Uh, yeah, another, so this is, uh, so the proof says immediate from definition. Is this immediate from definition? So let's try to write down the definition. So the definition, so the psi one norm of proof, psi one norm of x squared is in, T bigger than zero, e to the e to the x over t less than or equal to t, right? No, that's not right. So I have to apply this to x squared, right? So I have to apply this to x squared. I get this. So that's the psi one norm of x squared. Yeah, which is the right. definition of the psi two norm of x, right? No. No? Uh, there is a slight modification that you have to do. Right. Uh, what is the psi 2 norm definition of the psi 2? Go back to this. So that's the definition. So there is a t squared here. I mean, it uh, doesn't so see, matter, right? It is t or t squared. No. t squared is there, t is here, so it matters. Um, so you have to come here and do a little bit of a trick here. I so, see, I see, I see. So here we have t. So what is the trick? And t appears here. So you can do a change of variable, right? So I can do in, I can replace t with s squared, maybe bigger than zero. Expectation of e to the x squared, s squared less than or equal to two, right? That doesn't change anything. Yes. That's... And then I can say this is just the in s bigger than zero, blah, 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 but this to the square. Right? Because mm -hmm. the, this is a square. I can just take the infimal or s and then square it. Mm -hmm. And this is just the subcalcium norm of x. So I need to square it. So I get. 
So Gaussian rule of x squared. Right? So this goes here, whatever it is here, this is, this is there. So this goes there. Sounds good? Yes. Questions? Okay, and the second one is um, interesting. So fx and y are sub Gaussian, then x times y is sub exponential. And in fact, we have that psi one norms x times y is less than equal to the product of psi two norms. So this inequality actually gives you that directly because if the other side, if these two are finite, then this is gonna be finite, which shows that x times y is sub exponential. Uh, so the proof, without the originality, we're gonna assume this, uh, why can I assume without loss of generality that the psi two norms are one? Just scaling them. Yeah, so these are norms. I can, let's say, rescale everything by a constant. So by a scaling. And since you're dealing um, dealing with norms. So just verify this for yourself with norms. So just check that, that we can do that. So now if I do that, then this uh, right hand side is going to be one. Oh, yes. Okay. So I'm going to yeah, have to, nice. um, I have to verify that the left hand side is less than or equal to one. Um, there is this thing called Young's inequality, which in this special case is very simple. So this is an elementary inequality. Everyone agrees with this? Yes. Yeah, you just AMGM. Multiplied. Uh, AMGM. That could be it, but it's much simpler than that, right? So you just... Um, yeah, M minus B squared. Yeah. yeah, so this just says this is bigger than zero. Yes. Okay, that's this. Uh, so I'm gonna use this. So um, first we have this, then this is less than or equal to this, mm -hmm. right? By, so applying that inequality to, so take, um, take A to B, um, so A to B absolute value of X, B to B absolute value of Y. Uh, then I get, uh, this is just simple manipulation of the exponential. And then I get this other inequality. So why is this true? Apply again. Yes, we apply again with A being E to the X squared over two and B being e to the y squared over two, apply the same inequality. Uh, and then there is this last inequality, which is true, why? Mm. Uh, because the, we assume that their psi two norm is one. Yes, yeah, so um, psi two norm of X being less than one implies that expectation of e to the x squared is less than two, okay? Uh, because uh, this guy is the infimum over all t such that expectation of e to the x squared t squared is less than or equal to two. I guess when the infimum is less than one, it means that um, What does it mean? Uh, so uh, it means that anything above the so if one it, yes satisfies it, right? In yes. particular, one yes. satisfies it. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So I can take t to be anything bigger than or equal to one, um, and I would mm. still satisfy. It. Right, so each one, for each one we have an equality like this, 
uh, and also for y. So you get both, like the average would be less than two. Uh, and so the average less than two. So now we have proven that this is less than or equal to two. And from this, you can also work like, by the same type argument. It means that by definition, basically, means that the psi one norm of x, uh, y is less than two. Okay, in fact, this is similar to this. So uh, I can say this is if and only if. Okay, uh, and similarly, I have, let's say, z psi one less than or equal to one if and only if expectation of e to the z is less than or equal to two. Okay, verify this for yourself. Okay, if this is also if and only. Does that make sense to people? Questions? So I'm gonna add here, no independence needed. So we didn't need X and Y to be independent. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, so if you don't have a question, I'm gonna come back. And basically we can rewrite this Bernstein inequality similar to the one that we did for the sub-Gaussian. So we can write this Bernstein inequality, oh, this one actually, in terms of the psi one norm. Maybe just let me briefly mention that. So if you recall this, um, if I replace both nu and alpha with the psi one norm, uh, what I would get, uh, I can always bound both by constant times psi one norm, I would get uh, this type of result. That's another like a version of that, where I replace both alpha i and nu i with the psi one norm. And so that's how your um, book uh, states the Bernstein. So that's a restatement of the inequality that we get, tail bound that we got uh, in terms of the psi one or sub, sub exponential norm. And the other version is just the version, like a uh, modification where uh, you have a bound on all the psi one norms uh, to simplify. So I'm going to come back and talk about this a little bit. Um, but that's as far as self explanatory goes. And next time I'm going to talk about uh, examples. Okay, questions, comments? So I remember a little bit over time. Um, no questions? Okay, then, uh, if you have no questions, uh, thanks for listening and see you next time. Hopefully. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.